This incident sequence lasted a total of 31 seconds, about the same time that it takes to drink a tall glass of water. During these 31 seconds, years of delayed legislation, a deceitful resume, personal shortcomings and an incredible chain of events came together in the worst possible way. Stay tuned. Atlas Air Flight 3591 was scheduled as a domestic cargo flight going from Miami International Airport to George Bush Airport in Houston, United States. The flight took place on the 23rd of February 2019, but the complicated circumstances that led up to what ultimately happened to the aircraft had started more than a decade earlier. Because in response to several accidents and incidents that had happened during the 1990s, caused in part by pilot performance issues, a law called the Pilot Records Improvement Act, or PREA, had been implemented in the United States back in 1996. This law forced all airlines to review the training and employment history of any pilot they wanted to hire, and the background check needed to cover at least the preceding five years prior to the start of the new employment. The idea with this law was to highlight any training deficiencies that might have been noticed during the pilot's initial training or with their previous employers. But it soon became clear that the law lacked some important details. After the horrible accident of Colgan Air Flight 3407 in February of 2009, where the pilot flying made some very basic handling errors, it was found that he had been struggling during his initial training and that he had suffered multiple checkride failures. Now, this was exactly what Priya was designed to pick up, but the background check had failed to do so. This led the National Transportation Safety Board to recommend that PRIA should be amended by the implementation of something that they call the Pilot Records Database, or PRD. In this database, the training information of all pilots should be automatically uploaded and easily searchable with the help of the pilot's license number, making the background check easier to do and much more accurate. The United States Congress approved this suggestion and they mandated the FAA to implement the PRD within a reasonable time frame. But that time frame just kept getting longer and longer without the implementation of the law getting any closer. Finally, a deadline for the implementation was set to the 30th of April 2017, but sadly that date came and went without anything happening. 40 days after this deadline had expired, the pilot who was going to become the pilot flying in this story was hired by Atlas Air as a first officer on their Boeing 767 fleet. So why is this important? Well, the first officer was 44 years old at the time and had a total flying experience of just over 5,000 hours. He had a very troublesome training history behind him and as an example he had resigned from two of his previous airlines, Air Wisconsin and Commute Air, because he was unable to get through their initial training. But in his application to Atlas Air he had conveniently failed to include those airlines in his resume, stating that he had instead been studying for a college degree during those years where his employment had a noticeable gap. This was partially true, he had been studying, but he had also been failing his initial training in both of these airlines during that time, and one of those employments was well within the five-year scope of the PREA legislation. He did disclose a failure of an oral exam with Transstate Airlines, but he had missed to disclose the subsequent failure of his ERJ-145 air transport license upgrade, and he also later failed a line check that wasn't mentioned. But what should have been maybe the biggest red flag in his training history on his resume, which he by the way also failed to disclose, was his unsatisfactory attempt to upgrade to a captain on the ERJ-175 with Mesa Airlines, which happened just a few months before he was doing his interview with Atlas Air. These later discovered training records showed several very worrying tendencies, including that when he was faced with a situation that he wasn't expecting, he would sometimes react by just randomly starting to push buttons and make inputs on the flight controls in order to be seen as doing something, rather than taking the time to properly evaluate the situation together with his colleague. And that's worth remembering. Now, this all pointed towards an individual with personality traits not suitable for a commercial pilot, but he was able to mask these deficiencies on interviews, mainly because of the PREA legislation, which was built on the honesty of the applicant. 
It was very hard for the airline to find any records that the pilot didn't voluntarily disclose and that was exactly why the pilot records database was designed to sort out. But there was however one note in the documentation from the pilot that should have stood out to the recruitment team of Atlas Air. That note did come from his employment at Mesa Airlines and it stated that the pilot was returning to first officer after his command upgrade course had finished. This meant that the first officer managed to get through the interview, which by the way didn't include a simulator assessment, and he then started his training on the Boeing 767 with Atlas Air in the summer of 2017. Immediately there were signs of trouble as he was struggling to understand the performance calculations and airplane systems during his ground school training. He received some extra training for that and eventually passed his oral exam which enabled him to continue to the fixed base part of the type rating. The type specific training that pilots have to go through generally involves a ground school course and then a fixed base simulator training which is heavily dedicated to learning scan flows and normal procedures and then finally a full flight part in a moving simulator where emergency and handling scenarios are practiced. In the fixed base training his struggles continued as he couldn't get a grasp of the normal procedures which led to further extra training before he was allowed into the full flight part. But only after a few sessions in the full flight his sim partner had had enough and he complained to the instructors that he was being held back by the first officer. This led to his full flight simulator training being paused and then he restarted it from the very beginning again a few weeks later with a different partner. Unfortunately after he had started again the training was then disrupted by the effects of a hurricane and that lasted for a few days and after that he failed his first typewriting skill test on the 767. The reason stated for his failure by the examiner was unsatisfactory performance on crew resource management, threat and error management, non-precision approaches, steep turns and just general judgment. The uh, typewriting examiner did say though that the first officer was very nervous on the check ride and after another retraining session he finally passed the typewriting course and begun his flight training in the real aircraft. So should this lackluster performance have raised any red flags then? Well the training manager of the airline had looked over the first officer's file but concluded that he didn't need to be put under specific performance surveillance partially because of that hurricane interruption which had disrupted his training. At the time it was thought that this disruption might have been the reason for his check ride failure. Now after these initial issues the recurrent training and check-in during the subsequent two years had gone quite well with satisfactory results up until the day of flight 3591. So that was the story of the first officer, but what about the captain then? Well the captain was 60 years old and had been working for Atlas since 2015. He was quite experienced with just under 11,200 hours of total time and uh, 1,252 of those hours were flown on the Boeing 767. His training history was much better, but he had been under performance observation after a failed training day when he was still a first officer back in 2015. This performance observation protocol was finished about a year and a half later with satisfactory results and he was then successful in his command upgrade training in August 2018. Now it should be said very clearly here that a single training failure can happen to anyone for a variety of reasons. Things like personal circumstances can give anyone a bad day so having failed a single check ride doesn't necessarily mean anything but repeated failures is a completely different matter. In any case, these were the two pilots who were scheduled to fly Atlas Air Flight 3591 together on the 23rd of February 2019. They had flown together before on the previous day during which they had been flying a night duty but this flight was scheduled as a nice 1100 hour local departure with a flight time of only 1 hour and 45 minutes so it was potentially a quite relaxing day out in other words. The pilot met up before the flight and started looking through the pre-flight documentation as the cargo that they were going to be carrying was being loaded onto the aircraft. There were no particular no-tums that were planned to affect them but the weather around Houston looked a little bit challenging. A cold front was forecasted to be passing over the area from the northwest and when colder air moves in towards a warmer humid air mass it wedges itself under the warmer air and forces it upwards. 
This can cause the formation of some really heavy rain showers and even thunderstorms. But the good news here was that the worst weather should have passed by the time that they were planning to land. They discussed this and then decided on the final fuel that they would carry and then walked out towards the aircraft. Everything was being loaded according to standard operating procedures and the weight and balance of the aircraft was well within limits. On their walk out towards the aircraft, the crew was joined by a third pilot who wanted to travel with them on the jump seat over towards Houston. This was obviously not a problem as there was plenty of jump seats available on the cockpit of the 767 so he was welcome to tag along. The first officer was going to be pilot flying for the flight, so after the captain had verified the technical status of the aircraft, which was completely clear of faults, the captain went outside to complete the walk around and the first officer started working on the cockpit setup and prepared for the departure. The aircraft that they were going to fly was a 27-year-old Boeing 767-300, which had been converted into a freighter two years before the flight. It was in good condition and had, like I mentioned before, no technical problems recorded on it. Once the first officer was finished with his cockpit setup, he checked the time on his nice large wristwatch and saw that they were closing in on their scheduled departure time of 1100. And he let the captain know about this. The final checklist was completed and the aircraft pushed back, started its engines and taxied out for departure. At time 1108, Atlas Air Flight 3591 took off normally from runway 09 in Miami. The initial climb and cruise sections of this flight was completely uneventful and the aircraft leveled off at its planned cruising level of flight level 400 of 40,000 feet. Like I mentioned earlier, this was a relatively short flight, so when they started to get closer to their top of descent, the captain left the active ATC frequency in order to listen and record the latest weather for Houston. The ATIS information indicated that they could inspect one of the westerly facing runways, most likely runway 26 left or 27, which would give them the quickest taxi route in towards their stand. But the actual landing runway would be given to the crew later, when they were in contact with the approach ATC sector. The weather was okay, with some light to moderate rain showers in the area and some light winds from a westerly direction. Once this information had been received, the first officer handed over the controls to the captain and started setting up the FMC for the expected arrival and approach. They discussed using auto brake setting 2 and landing flaps of 25 degrees and with reported winds of 320 degrees at 14 knots, the crew decided to use a fly speed of 135 knots for the landing. As they were discussing this, air traffic control came in and advised them that after they had passed the Arnav point called Girli, they could proceed with the Link 1 arrival route towards Houston, and this matched very well what they had prepared to do. The problem though was that that cold front that had been forecasted to pass through was now situated between the aircraft and the airport. The front line was full of active storm clouds and this would likely force the pilots to have to ask for radar vectors later on, away from their arrival route, in order to make sure that they wouldn't have to cross those storms. And this will become very important very soon. At time 12.07, the Houston controller called the aircraft up and gave them their first descent clearance to flight level 350. This was promptly read back by the captain and then the aircraft started descending. During the following minutes, the pilots discussed several waypoint speed and altitude restrictions, and it seemed to be some confusion as to how these restrictions should be interpreted. Sometimes a certain restriction is only applicable if the aircraft is following a specific arrival, but not if it's following another arrival, and this discussion took up quite some time during the initial descent. Air traffic control continued to give further descent clearances, and at time 12.12, the first officer handed over the controls to the captain and started his approach briefing. And speaking about briefings, here comes one from my sponsor. I just want to tell you about a fantastic streaming platform that I'm sure that most aviation enthusiasts among you will absolutely love, and that's CuriosityStream, today's sponsor. For a really affordable price, CuriosityStream gives you access to thousands of award-winning documentaries and series anytime and anywhere. With CuriosityStream, you can dive into topics like the evolution of the jet engine, the secrets of the SR-71 Blackbird, and the story of the Wright brothers' first flight. You can also stream thousands of other shows covering everything from science and technology to history, culture and sport. With new content added every week, I find that there's always something new to discover on the platform. I recently watched an incredible documentary, which takes you on a journey through the history of flight, featuring some rare archive footage and interviews with aviation pioneers. 
So if you are ready to take your love for aviation to new heights, well then head over to curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot or scan this QR code on the screen here. If you use the promo code mentorpilot, you will save 25% off your purchase, making it crazy good value. Thank you Curiosity Stream. Now let's continue the story. As the aircraft was descending down towards Houston, the crew was told to switch the radios over to Houston Center on frequency 133 decimal 8. The captain read back this new frequency, but waited with calling up the next controller until after the first officer had finished his approach briefing, taking back the controls and the descent checklist had been completed. The new controller confirmed the arrival route and the captain asked which runway they could expect. Now, the controller responded that he didn't have this information and that seemed to slightly annoy the captain, who was now trying to plan his descent down towards the airport. Knowing which runway to expect is quite important, since approaching different runways will mean a different amount of track miles and that will have an effect on how quickly an aircraft needs to descend. Descent planning in large aircraft is all about energy management. The more track miles you have to fly, the slower you need to descend to get rid of the energy. But if you plan with having a lot of track miles and then you suddenly get a shortcut to a closer runway, you might have to descend much quicker, potentially even having to use the speed brake or even flaps to achieve this. The other issue with not knowing what runway and approach to expect is that the pilot monitoring might potentially have to go into the FMCCDU at a later stage and reprogram it to a different approach than what they had previously briefed. If that happens, this will take the pilot monitoring away from his task of monitoring the flight progress and this will soon become important. During the next couple of minutes, the pilots were discussing different speeds to be used during the descent. The captain wanted to fly quicker, as we often do, but the first officer was pointing out that there were speed restrictions as part of the arrival route, so an increase in speed might not be a great idea, as they would have to decelerate soon anyway. These are all quite standard discussions that you would hear in any cockpit, and it seems like the CRM was working quite well at this stage with just some standard banter going on. At time 12, 30 and 13 seconds, the aircraft was told to switch over to the Houston approach controller. Now they would finally be told which landing runway they would get. The controller welcomed them to the new frequency and then gave them the name of the current ATIS information, as well as the altimeter pressure setting. He then told the crew to fly the published transition route for runway 26 left. As soon as the captain heard this, he dived into the FMC CDU and started setting up the final part of the routing to the approach. Once that was done, the crew set their altimeters to the current pressure setting and the captain started actioning the approach checklist. When that checklist was completed, the first officer started complaining about how he didn't think that the virtual navigation or VNAV of the autopilot was doing a great job. He was expecting it to stay a bit higher than they currently were and to start decelerating earlier and these comments led into a discussion between the pilots of how little they trusted the automatics. It is likely that Vina was actually doing what it could at this point but every time that the pilots updated the routing or set another speed restriction Vina would have to reprogram its calculated descent path leading to fluctuations on how it flew. At time 12, 34 and 8 seconds, the approach controller called the crew up and advised them about a line of heavy precipitation coming up just in front of them. This was the cold front that they had seen on the planning stage and the controller told them to advise him if they needed vectors to avoid, basically turning around the storms in front of them. And it is at this point that the actions that will eventually lead up to the accident really start. Because as the crew were now looking at their weather radar, trying to decide which way to turn to avoid the storms, they were now handed over to the next approach controller. When the captain checked in, the new controller wanted to know if they needed vectors towards the east of the weather in front, which would give them a significantly longer route, or if they had any other intentions. The captain told the controller to stand by, and now the first officer suddenly makes a statement about his instruments. It wasn't possible to hear on the cockpit voice recorder exactly what the problems with his instruments were, but the captain responded with a quick laugh and that was then followed by the first officer handing over the controls to the captain in an attempt to try and quickly fix whatever that problem was. As soon as the captain had taken the controls, the first officer reached over and pushed the electronic flight instrument switch on the right side of his instrument panel. This switch was used to change the source used for the instrumentation on his side from a primary to an alternate source. 
Apparently, it was a well-known fix on the Boeing 767 that if the displays would start acting up for whatever reason, pushing the EFI switch momentarily would reset the fault and then the switch could go back to the normal position again with everything sorted. As the first officer was doing this, they continued to discuss which the best route for them would be around the storms. The first officer was handling the radios as he was trying to fix his instruments and he now asked the controller if they could turn to the west to avoid the clouds that way. This would give them the shortest track to fly and likely save them quite a few minutes. The controller came back and said that the only problem with that vector was that there was a lot of departing traffic in that sector which they would have to avoid. The pilots discussed this and they then responded that it was fine with them to go to the east instead because they had loads of fuel on board anyway. But the controller that had heard their first request had now figured out a way for the aircraft to actually take that vector to the west instead. But it would require them to keep a higher descent rate down to 3000 feet in order to keep out of the way for the departing traffic. The first officer read this back and the captain then set 3000 feet on the mode control panel and selected level change as the descent mode for the autopilot and the auto throttle. The EFI button had now been pushed and it apparently fixed the problem because the captain laughed shortly and the first officer responded that the EFI always fixes the problem. They now received an instruction to turn left onto heading of 270 degrees and after having set that the captain handed back the controls to the first officer. As soon as the first officer took over, he remembered what the controller had said about keeping a high descent rate, so he reached over and extended the speed brakes into the flight detent position. This raised the spoilers on the wings, creating more drag and therefore increased the descent rate. Now, every time that the speed brake is in use, the standard operating procedure at Atlas Air was for the pilot flying to keep one hand on it, as a reminder to stow it when it was no longer needed. The speed brake is situated on the left side of the throttle quadrant, so in order for the first officer to hold it, he needed to reach under and past the thrust levers. The captain was now heads down into the FMC CDU again, trying to connect the route in the most sensible way to get the descent guidance from VNAV. And like I mentioned earlier, this also meant that he likely wasn't looking at the instruments at this point. He asked if he should connect the route via a point called Greg on the approach and the first officer agreed and at the same time asked for flaps 1 to be extended to further increase the drag and the descent rate. Flaps 1 was selected, the routing towards Greg was executed and the captain then called LNAV available, which was not the right thing to do here since the aircraft was on a radar heading and shouldn't follow that new route that he had created. But the first officer still tried to connect the LNAV, but since the aircraft was not on an intercept heading at that point, it didn't engage. This caused a bit of confusion before they both realized the mistake that they had made. And this is a tiny little thing, but it shows some level of degraded situational awareness here, possibly from the added stress of avoiding the storms, departing traffic and planning the routing towards the approach. The aircraft was now descending through around 7,000 feet and had just entered some clouds associated with the front that they were just about to pass. This meant that the pilots were now flying in instrument conditions, without any outside references and at the same time some light to moderate turbulence started rocking the aircraft. At time 12, 38 and 31 seconds, when the aircraft descended through 6,300 feet, a distinct click could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder. Immediately after this click, the thrust levers started moving forward from their idle position towards almost full thrust and the nose of the aircraft started slowly pitching up from an attitude of around minus one degree to four degrees nose up. So what was going on? Well, remember that big wristwatch that the first officer was wearing? It is very likely that since he was holding the speed brake lever with his left hand when the turbulence started, that wristwatch came into contact with the toga button, which on the 767 is situated on the lower side of the thrust levers. That click that was heard on the cockpit voice recorder was therefore likely the toga button being activated by mistake. Now, if the toga switch was activated, that would send signals to the autopilot to keep its current track, maintain the speed and start the climb with at least 2000 feet per minute. In any case, the toga activation was likely not noticed by either pilot at this stage because none of them mentioned anything. 
Instead, the first officer started to retract the speed brake and move it into the down and arm position, possibly as a reaction to the thrust levers moving forward, as that would have been the reaction to do in case the aircraft was leveling off at the cleared altitude. Now, in order to understand what is going to happen during the coming 31 seconds, we need to examine the way that the human body reacts to certain accelerations and movements. We humans use basically three different ways to determine orientation and movement within a space. The first way is with the help of the vestibular system, which is situated in the inner ear where the otolit organs senses direction and accelerations. The second are the nerves in the skin, muscles and joints who feels their position based on gravity, general feeling and sounds. And finally, we use our eyesight that uses visual inputs to make sense of all those other feelings. The problem is that the vestibular system cannot distinguish between acceleration caused by gravity and other types of accelerations, like that of an accelerating or maneuvering aircraft, for example. And with the visual cues gone, like in this case where the aircraft was inside of a cloud, a type of sensory illusion, known as somatographic illusion, can therefore start affecting the pilots. And it can happen very quickly if we're not careful. This illusion is caused by the effect of added thrust to the aircraft, which led to a sudden acceleration. That acceleration would have forced the pilots gently backwards into their chairs, and at the same time, the aircraft started pitching up, causing exactly the same type of feeling. Inside the vestibular system, both of these accelerations would have been added to each other, and without a visual reference point, the brain of the first officer would have interpreted these two accelerations as one much more abrupt sudden pitch up. This is actually exactly the same type of illusion that we use in full flight simulators to simulate accelerations and decelerations. Now, the correct way to stop this illusion from progressing would have been to concentrate on the artificial horizon in front of him, which would have accurately told him that the pitch up was much smaller than the one that he was sensing. But remember, this pilot had a history of reacting immediately under stress without taking the time to carefully evaluate the situation that he was in. So what happened now was that the first officer started pitching the aircraft forward, down towards the ground below. The autopilot was still engaged, but the force of the first officer's pitch down command was enough to override it, and the aircraft started an accelerated descent. This then led to the next problem, which was a decrease in the aircraft's vertical acceleration and a rapid increase in the longitudinal forward acceleration, which likely just made the somatographic illusion even worse, causing a sensation of tumbling backwards, a very nasty sensation. This feeling is known as the inversion illusion, since the feeling is completely opposite to what's actually happening. This is likely why the first officer now cried out ooh and whoa as he started pitching forward even more. A sudden shock like this can trigger a fight or flight response in the human brain, which will favor a strong physical reaction but severely hamper the brain's ability to accurately assess what really needs to be done. This often leads to impulsive and incorrect actions known as a startle response, which is exactly what happened here. As the pitch was now decreasing, the aircraft descent rate kept increasing rapidly. An owl beeper warning went off in the cockpit, likely caused by the autopilot warning that manual input was overriding it, and it was followed by the first officer calling out, where is my speed, and we're stalling. Now, there was nothing in this scenario that should have led the first officer into believing that the aircraft was stalling. The speed was well above the stall onset speed, and it was increasing rapidly. There was no stick shaker and the red and black barber's poles on the speed display were not anywhere near the speed that they were flying. The only possible explanation for this call out was that the first officer felt like the aircraft was violently pitching up and thus possibly stalling. Again, a quick instrument scan would have shown clearly what was going on and there is no indication that there was anything wrong with this instrument at this time. Now, the combined forces and acceleration caused by the sudden pitch forward combined with the increasing acceleration of the aircraft would have now caused a force vector acting on the first officer's inner ear similar to a vertical drop with the aircraft attitude at the wing's level position. Likely a truly terrifying feeling. 
Now, if the first officer thought that it was stalling, the correct initial action would have indeed been to unload the wings by pitching forward. But the continuation of that procedure should have been to recover the aircraft back towards wings level once the stall indications, the stick shaker or buffeting, would have disappeared. But in this situation, there were no actual stall indications other than what was in the first officer's head. All of the things that have happened up until this point after the inadvertent TOG activation had only taken around 13 seconds, which is about the same time it has taken me to say this sentence. It all happened really quickly. But what about the captain then? What was he doing and why didn't he intervene? Well, when the first officer inadvertently activated the TOGA button, the captain was still working on the route in the FMC CDU and he also had just received a message from air traffic control that he was responding to. This likely meant that during those crucial first 13 seconds, he didn't monitor the instruments and he didn't notice the extreme inputs that the first officer was suddenly making. When the owl warning went off, he would have looked up trying to make sense of what was going on, but the same sensory inputs that the first officer was experiencing would have affected him as well, probably slowing down his assessment and leading to some initial real confusion. If he would have been paying attention to the instruments when this all started, he would likely have been able to take over the controls and disconnect the automatics much sooner. But from the position that he was now in, it would have all been sudden chaos and very hard to initially correctly assess. The fact that he was head down when this all started would have also explained why he didn't notice that the flight mode denunciator had gone into go-around mode as soon as the toga button was accidentally pushed. In any case, at time 12.38 and 51 seconds, the aircraft had entered into a terrifying dive with an attitude of 46.1 degrees pitch down and with that a rapidly accelerating airspeed passing 359 knots. That is above the max speed of the aircraft and around 100 knots faster than the maximum speed with flap 1 extended. And just to give you some reference of how serious this aircraft situation was, an aircraft upset situation in pitch, which we pilots are trained to always try and recover from, is defined as the aircraft exceeding either 25 degrees nose up pitch or 10 degrees nose down. In this case, the aircraft had a nose attitude 36 degrees lower than what would be considered an upset, descending through 3,500 feet with a vertical speed of around 9,000 feet per minute. Here, the captain must have gained his bearings slightly because some pitch up force was recorded coming from the left control column and he could be heard shouting, what's going on? The thrust lever was now also moved temporarily into the idle and then pushed back up again, but we don't know which one of the pilots who actually did that. But the fact that the captain now started to try to pull up was not accompanied by a formal my controls command, which would have been the right thing to do. Instead, the two pilots were now pushing and pulling in opposite directions. The first officer was unable to respond to the captain's question about what was going on. Instead, he continued making panicked callouts, which he continued to do for the rest of the flight. Now, the reason that we know that the two pilots were working against each other at this point was because the flight data record started recording different angles of the left and right elevator at the back of the horizontal stabilizer. Because there is a function that, in case one of the controls gets jammed, will allow the other control to override the clutch and control the elevators separately to enable control of the aircraft in spite of the jam. This requires quite some force and that's exactly what was now happening. Unfortunately, the captain's opposite commands were not enough to stop the downward pitch that the first officer had already put in motion. The vertical speed increased to over 9,000 feet per minute as the aircraft descended through 3,000 feet. So why didn't the captain just take over the controls? Well, in a rapidly developing emergency like this, it would have been very hard for the captain to actually understand what was happening and what was causing it. He would have seen that the first officer was not incapacitated and that he was still inputting on the controls and because of that it would have been very hard for him to judge if the first officer was trying to solve the issue or was actually causing it. 
Severe startle and surprise works opposite to logic and clear decision making and for the captain to go from programming the FMC into grasping that the first officer was suddenly pushing the nose of the aircraft down towards the ground in just a few seconds was likely too much to ask for. So his delayed response was likely due to a combination of startle, confusion and shock. In any case, the two pilots continued to input opposite controls for a total of around 10 agonizing seconds before the pilot on the jump seat called pull up. This likely happened as the aircraft passed around 3000 feet, which corresponded with the cloud base and below the clouds the visibility was good. This would have made the full terrifying picture of their attitude and descent trajectory instantly clear for both pilots. And from this point, the first officer control input changed to full pitch up. Together with the captain's inputs, they managed to get the nose up to around 16 degrees below the horizon, causing a wing loading of around 4 Gs as they pulled with full force and with the overspeed warning blaring behind them in the cockpit. Unfortunately, this was all too little too late. There just wasn't enough altitude left to recover the aircraft and at time 12.39 and 3 seconds, only 31 seconds after the toga button had been inadvertently pushed, the aircraft crashed into the marshlands on the outskirts of Trinity Bay with a vertical speed of 12,850 feet per minute and a total airspeed of 434 knots. The aircraft was immediately destroyed and scattered over an area bigger than 12 acres of mostly shallow water and muddy marshlands and all three pilots immediately perished. Now, some of you might be asking, why weren't there any GPWS warnings sounding in the cockpit? I mean, with that kind of a trajectory, that warning should have activated early and might have pulled the first officer out of his somatographic illusion. Well, it turns out that the aircraft was equipped with a Honeywell and Hans GPWS system that was functioning well during the accident, but the problem was that the angle and extreme speed that the aircraft had when it got closer to the ground caused the radio altitude data that was fed into the system to be flagged by the computer as being unrealistic. That caused the computer to disregard the radio altimeter for three seconds, which stopped the system from ever issuing a warning. But even if it would have worked, it wouldn't have made any difference. It was just too late at that point. The rescue work very quickly turned into a recovery operation since it was clear that it wouldn't be any survivors after this crash. The aircraft had been reduced to millions of pieces of very small debris that was spread out over a huge area and it took specialized machines several weeks to recover most of it and bring it into a hangar where the pieces were placed together as accurately as possible. Both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were eventually found and even though the audio quality wasn't great from the voice recorder, a picture of what had caused this crash quickly emerged. The National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the crash had been caused by the inadvertent activation of the aircraft's toga button, which had then led to a change in pitch and acceleration that went initially undetected. These changes caused the first officer, who was pilot flying, to experience somatographic illusion and due to his documented personality weaknesses in stress management and situational awareness and just general pilot suitability, he was unable to recover from the illusion and instead pushed the aircraft into a dive from which they were unable to recover. The final report were very critical to both the hiring procedures in Atlas Air, who had failed to notice the first officer's command upgrade failure just month before the recruitment, but most of all the critique landed hard on the FAA's failure to implement the pilot records database at the time of the accident. The first officer had clearly concealed part of his training history with two other airlines and had this database been in place, a simple search on his license number would have revealed both the failures and his attempts to conceal them and that likely would have stopped him from being hired in the first place. This was an accident that really shouldn't have happened and it highlights just how important it is for airlines to vet their pilots carefully and for important safety critical legislation to be implemented as quickly as possible. The pilot records database has since been implemented and this accident also led to some research into the possibility of implementing the more advanced military GPWS system into civilian airliners. A system like that would have been able to predict the trajectory of the aircraft earlier, which would likely have been helpful.
Now, check out this video next, or if you're interested in seeing more incident and accident videos, then check out this playlist. Please consider supporting my work by sending a super thanks, buying some awesome merch, or join my fantastic Patreon crew. All support is hugely appreciated. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.